Hello, these are flipped notes 2-3, all about neurotransmitters. I've got my Bitmoji and her current mood because that's one of the big jobs of neurotransmitters is to affect our current mood. But first, uh, we actually left off a couple types of neurons in the last video, so we're going to cover those super quick. We've got glial cells and mirror neurons. Glial cells, um, our little meme here, it says we're here to support you, and that's what they do for neurons. So they're a specific type of neurons, uh, or cells, sorry, that surround neurons and provide support for an insulation between them. You can see in the image here that the glial cells actually help to form some of the myelin sheath. Um, there are multiple types of glial cells, but for what we do in AP Psych, we don't need to know all the different types. Um, we do want to know that they're the most abundant cell type in the central nervous system, and they outnumber neurons 50 to 1. Uh, and when we watched that crash course video, um, they talked about that glial cells account for half the mass of the brain. So super important, but often overlooked, um, but important to the structure of neurons overall. The other type of neurons that we want to mention before we go too far in the chapter are mirror neurons. Uh, mirror neurons are really something fairly new um, to science. They were kind of discovered probably less than 20 years ago. Um, but they are neurons that fire the same when you are watching something as if you were actually doing it. And they found these in both humans and animals. So what seems to happen is that if you are observing somebody performing an action, like let's say you're watching somebody do a golf swing, your mirror neurons will fire in the brain similar to as if you were actually swinging that golf club. Um, so it seems to provide a neural basis for <clears throat> imitation and empathy. So it's not going to fire quite to the same level, but it does fire while you're watching uh, as if you were actually doing it. And this is happening in the premotor cortex. So some of the implications here, if you the response is similar if you were performing the action as if you were witnessing the action, even as if you were hearing about the action. And you can see and they're showing that different parts of the brain's lighting up um, the same, and it's not quite to the same extent, but in the same areas as if you were performing, witnessing, or hearing. Um, so the research is indicating that maybe this plays a role in empathy, helping us to understand how other people feel, helps us with skill building, why watching film, or watching YouTube videos, um, or image, imagining yourself doing a dance performance, why all of those seem to actually help your performance, that your mirror neurons are helping you. Uh, and then also vicarious experience. That's where you're like living through somebody else, how when somebody tells you a story about their vacation and they're excited about it and then you feel excited about it, um, it's those mirror neurons that are doing that. So pretty special stuff. Also makes you question, what happens if somebody doesn't have mirror neurons? Uh, we don't really have full answers to that, but you wonder if that may be a reason why some people lack empathy. And can you grow mirror neurons? Can you build more? If you build more empathy over time, can you build more neuron, mirror neurons? Don't have the answers to those either. Um, here showing some more brain imaging, how when somebody's actually feeling pain, that when you see that and you feel that empathy for that pain, it's lighting up in similar areas. Again, not the same, but it is showing that your brain is responding as if you were actually doing it. Um, some more examples here of somebody is actually reaching for something versus somebody else who's watching them reach for it. Um, again, similar parts of the brain lighting up, but not quite to the same extent. So glial cells, mirror neurons. But we are really here for neurotransmitters. So in the previous section, we learned all about neurons, uh, and we know that neurons don't touch each other. So it is up to the neurotransmitters to relay the messages from one neuron to the next neuron. So our neurotransmitters, or our abbreviation is NTs, are chemicals that transmit info from one neuron to another. So our neurotransmitters are these little chemicals here floating across the synapse to bind at the next receptor site. So We've had this image before. Here's our neuron, um, our sending neuron, our action potential. When that action potential gets to the end, to our axon terminal, we've got neurotransmitters here waiting in the vesicles to be released. They release across the gap, and they land on the receptor sites of the dendrites of the receiving neuron. After that happens, the neurotransmitters are released, and they either dissolve or they go through the process of reuptake where they go back to the previous neuron 
and they are repackaged into synaptic vesicles where they are used again. So some key ideas here again, synthesis, which is our creation of neurotransmitters, is actually happening in those synaptic vesicles. That's where they come from. Uh, they're released into the synaptic cleft. They bind to specific receptor sites that are designed to receive that specific neurotransmitter. And when they're there, the neurotransmitter deliver, delivers an excitatory or an inhibitory message. Excitatory, it's telling that next neuron to fire again, send another action potential. Or it could be inhibitory, saying we are done firing until they get a different message. Uh, then those neurotransmitters become inactive, they drift away, or they go through reuptake to that presynaptic neuron. So there have been about 60 different neurotransmitters that scientists have identified. Um, we in Psych only worry about seven or eight of them. The first one that was actually identified was acetylcholine, or ACH is its abbreviation, and we actually sometimes will call it ACH. Um, all of these are very complex, um, but for the purposes of psych, we try to make them simple. Um, so some of these, you know, you'll see that there's lots of different jobs, and it really kind of depends where that specific neurotransmitter is acting in the body, uh, that it could act differently, and what other neurotransmitters are present because we know that they're also affected by other neurotransmitters around them. So these are kind of simplified explanations for something that are super complex. So acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter that activates motor neurons and it controls skeletal muscles. So I tried to include an emoji for a bunch of these to help you remember what they do. And I've got the dancing girl one here uh, because she is dancing. Acetylcholine is what would get her muscles to move. Acetylcholine also has a big role in memory. So a dancer has to remember dance movements. Um, so she's got memory and movement going on there. Um, we know that things happen to neurotransmitters that can cause a surplus or a deficit. Uh, and different diseases are affected by, or different neurotransmitters can trigger different disorders. Um, Alzheimer's disease uh, is what happens as ACH um, neurotransmitters deteriorate. And we know that probably one of the biggest symptoms of Alzheimer's disease is memory deteriorating over time. So we know that ACH controls memory. So when we have a deficit in ACH, that can be a symptom of Alzheimer's disorder. A surplus in acetylcholine could be linked to muscle spasms. So since it helps with muscle movement, too much acetylcholine could cause muscle spasms. Our next neurotransmitter is dopamine. Uh, I don't usually use, usually use the abbreviation. Um, dopamine has a couple big jobs. One is voluntary movement. So I've got my running girl on there. But probably what dopamine is most no well known for is that it is a it causes pleasurable emotions. It is a feel good neurotransmitter. So when you're eating a delicious cupcake, you get a little dopamine rush uh, and you feel good. Uh, you hear a good song, dopamine rush. You feel happy. So when little things happen naturally, you get and that make you feel good, it's dopamine that's being released that makes you feel good. However, too much dopamine has been linked to some other issues. Um, at, people who are schizophrenic have too much dopamine being produced. Uh, and you kind of think of that that's like too much extra sensations. One of the common symptoms of schizophrenia are hallucinations and delusions. People who are starved of dopamine or have a deficit um, that is linked to tremors, so they cannot control their muscle movement, um, and that's a symptom of Parkinson's disease. Um, drugs often are trying to mimic the effects of dopamine. So cocaine, amphetamines, they are elevating um, dopamine receptors at the synapses, uh, and they're causing that same pleasurable feeling, but to a much greater extent. So... Dopamine is definitely playing a role in drugs of addiction. So a normal dopamine receptor is gonna release dopamine from something that makes us feel good, like eating some delicious food. But a drug such as cocaine is gonna give a much bigger effect. And actually what's happening here is cocaine is blocking the dopamine from reuptake. So those same dopamine neurotransmitters are being reused over and over again. So the exaggerated release of dopamine due to drugs such as cocaine can change our nervous system. Um, there's a lot of research now into why cell phones have become so addictive for us. 
Uh, and it's pretty much the same way as addiction, that when you get um, a like on a comment or somebody sends you a text message or somebody sends you a Snapchat message, um, that you get a little dopamine release and you become addicted to that. So cell phones, are they really dopamine devices? Are they the cause of our digital addiction? The do that dopamine is the cause there. Our next one is serotonin. Serotonin is pretty complex in that it can definitely act different in different situations. Um, but at its most basic level, it plays a role in sleep and arousal, so our sleep-wake cycles. Definitely known as a mood neurotransmitter. Plays a role in hunger. It kind of mellows us out, inhibits aggression. Um, but when our, our serotonin levels are out of balance, it can be linked to depression, OCD, all of these. Whenever we say somebody has a chemical imbalance, we're actually referring to their neurotransmitter, meter, neurotransmitter levels not being quite uh, in balance. Drugs like Prozac and antidepressants, they are targeting serotonin levels. Um, and probably the most common type of antidepressants are called SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. And what those do for serotonin is that after serotonin has delivered its message, um, the SSRIs will block the serotonin from reuptake. So the serotonin will stay in the synapse longer, and it'll elevate serotonin levels, which could elevate mood. Um, there are some studies that having a surplus of serotonin is linked with autism. Uh, in about 25% cases of um, autism, they found that. Um, but it's not the case for everybody. Autism is pretty complicated. Um, serotonin is the main contributor to well-being and happiness. So again, sleep-wake cycle, mood, uh, hunger levels. And when you think when a person is depressed because they may have low serotonin levels, those are definitely all things um, that tie in there, their hunger levels, their sleep-wake cycles. Our next neurotransmitter is norepinephrine. Uh, we've, I don't have an emoji on this one, but I have someone saying, ah, oh, danger, run for your life, because norepinephrine plays a major role in the fight or flight response. It helps control alertness and arousal, gets the body ready. It's part of that sympathetic response. If somebody has a low level of norepinephrine, that can be linked to depression. Think somebody who's depressed, they just can't get up. They can't get excited. They can't raise those energy levels. Um, so they're having too little norepinephrine. Um, too much can be related to anxiety. Um, cocaine and amphetamines like methamphetamine, they elevate neurotransmitter, sorry, neuro, nor, norepinephrine neurotransmitters. Uh, and they get people kind of hyped up. Uh, and going, going, going. Um, our next two actually kind of go together as opposites, GABA and glutamate. GABA stands for gamma, and you don't even have to know what it stands for. Just know GABA is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter. What that means when it's inhibitory is that as soon as it delivers its message, it's telling the next neuron to stop firing, stop this relay chain, don't send another signal. Um, if we don't have enough GABA, that can be linked to seizures, tremors, and insomnia, all of which are when you can't calm your brain down. So GABA is telling your brain to calm down. Um, it helps to regulate anxiety, to calm down the nervous system. But if we have too little, we're not calming down. We're staying hyped up. We can't fall asleep. Seizures is uncontrolled neural activity. Tremors, continuous muscle shaking. The contrast to GABA is glutamate. Glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter, and it is telling neurons to fire again. I've kind of got this crazy dog here because that's what I think of with glutamate. This is this dog that's going, going, going. Uh, glutamate plays a role in memory, um, but too much glutamate can overstimulate the brain. Think you're hyped up, you're hyped up, and too much of that can trigger a migraine um, or even a seizure. Um, glutamate can be found in MSG. Uh, which is often found in a lot of Asian foods and some seasonings. Uh, and MSG can raise your blood pressure, cause headaches or migraines. So too much glutamate can cause some definite problems uh, with your overactivity in your brain. Um, our last one is substance P. And we really don't have to know a whole lot about this one. It's recently just popped up on the AP exam the last few years. Um, but the main thing we associate with substance P is that it controls pain perception, that it's telling the brain that you need to feel pain when something puts you in pain or in danger. 
sorry, I lied. That wasn't the last one. Our last one is endorphins. Endorphins also contribute to pain relief, but also pleasurable, pleasurable emotions. So it kind of acts like dopamine there. Uh, it resembles some of the opiate structures um, of some drugs like heroin. Um, opiate, or sorry, endorphins give a good pleasurable feeling. Um, and a lot of people have talked before about runner's highs, that when you're running and running and running, eventually you bust through a wall and you feel really good. Um, associated with high endorphin levels. Even if you're not running a marathon, even if you're just exercising, or maybe you watch a really funny movie or some funny video clips, uh, you get your heart rate up and then you feel good after that, that's endorphins that's making you feel good. So quick recap, acetylcholine, muscle contractions, memory and learning, um, a deficit there linked to Alzheimer's disease. Dopamine is movement, but also it's a rewarding sensation. Too little can be Parkinson's, too much schizophrenia, and also plays a role in drug addiction. Um, serotonin, the one for well-being, emotional states, sleep, low levels of serotonin are linked to depression. Norepinephrine gets us up for fight or flight, physical arousal, but low norepinephrine can be related to depression. GABA is the inhibitory one, can calm you down. If you don't have enough GABA, though, that can be linked to anxiety disorders or you can't calm down. The contrast to GABA was glutamate, uh, which gets you fired up, excitatory. Endorphins play a role in pain perception, the runner's high. Uh, it is similar to the feeling that opiates trigger. And then substance P is not on here, but that one was also for pain perception. All right, the last part here is about agonists and antagonists. And we've been talking about some drugs that have some of the same effects as neurotransmitters. Well, drugs are actually agonists or antagonists. Um, so they are both some type of outside or external substance that can interact with a neurotransmitter, but they interact differently. So a neurotransmitter binds at a receptor site, and the receptor site has a very specific way that it links with that neurotransmitter. It's like a lock and key mechanism. An agonist is similar enough to a neurotransmitter that a neuron will let it bind there. Um, so for example, morphine is an agonist um, for endorphins. It is similar enough in structure that a neuron will say, okay, we'll accept morphine. And morphine will mimic the effect of endor endorphins. It creates this pleasurable sensation. An antagonist, you can see in this image, is different. It'll sit there, but because it's not similar enough, it can't stimulate the receptor site. So what it's doing instead, it is blocking anything else from getting in there. Um, curare is a poison that paralyzes its victims. It's what um, natives would put on arrowhead tips to paralyze an animal while they were trying to hunt it. Um, so curare is actually blocking ACH from getting through, and ACH has to do um, with movement. So agonists mimic neurotransmitters, antagonists inhibit or block them. Um, the key analogy, um, we have a house key, which will turn a lock. A master key uh, will open lots of different locks, and then a fake or a wrong key. An agonist is like a master key. So these are drugs that can sit in a lot of different uh, receptor sites, and they're close enough to the original that they're going to work. An antagonist would be like a fake key. It can go into the lock, but it's not going to turn. Um, and this would be something that blocks, like we mentioned, curare. Um, Botox is another example of an antagonist that blocks acetylcholine. Uh, it'll stop movement. So people will often use it for wrinkles to, and then kind of the side effect is that they can't move that part of their face. All right, that's it for Flip Notes 2-3 and neurotransmitters.